Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman, and today I am super excited to have with me on the line uh, Pekka Takala, and he is in Oulu, Finland. And uh, let's uh, let's pop on over. We're going to do something special. We're going to get out on the bike with Pekka. So here we are. <laughs> Pekka, thank you so much for doing this. This is going to be fun. Oh yeah, welcome, John. It's a pleasure. So let's uh, let's get out and do some riding. Yeah, let's do that. All right. With this wonderful bike of mine from 1952. So I it's only it. 70 years old. Oh, fantastic. What a classic. It is. It is. And it's a wonderful ride. Yeah, yeah. And is that a, a single speed or do you have gears on there? Yeah. Okay. Single it's speed. a single speed and coaster brake. So it's perfect for doing rides like this. Where I can just use my legs for braking and my hands are free for anything else. Right. So here yeah. you see the induction loops ah, embedded yes. into the surface. You see them here? Yes, sure do. And in addition, we have this small pole here that is an optical detector. So whenever someone passes here walking, it gives both signals. And whenever somebody is cycling here, we only get one signal. So it's easy to differentiate with, between the two. Yeah. It seems like you have to update your stencil there. You had the, uh, the parents... Uh, you know, walking with the child, uh, but you don't have a, a, a person walking with the dog. Oh, yeah, indeed. <laughs> but that means we would require quite a lot of different pictures then. <laughs> indeed. Fantastic. So why don't you give a, a little bit of an introduction to, to what we're looking at here and uh, really the philosophy of how the walking and cycling network is is really organized in Oulu. Oh, yeah, that's important. So currently in Oulu, which is a city of about 210,000 people living here, and uh, currently we have about 940, 950 kilometers of totally segregated bicycle paths. Many of them are like these, so they are not even adjacent to any major roads. Some are, of course, following major roads and so on. But we have several direct connections from the city center between the city, uh, city suburbs and from the city center to districts and suburbs where you don't necessarily have to even cross a single road or very few ones that makes them really really fast effective safe and comfortable so they are really an alternative a real alternative to other modes of transportation fantastic yeah and when when you look at the history of this network being developed what existed before the, this time Yes, yeah, so I'm glad you asked. So yeah, uh, the city used to be quite small until like 1950s, 1960s, maybe about 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 people, I'm not sure. But as the city started growing rapidly in the post-World War II era, and our economy was finally recovering from the war times, uh, the city started growing rapidly and they understood that we need a traffic engineer here. And luckily, they did chose a wonderful person for the job called Mauri Müllula, who understood the importance of walking and cycling and what it means to our society, the well-being of, of us all. And that was a difficult task for him because 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, even 90s here were the era of strongest possible automobilization. He really did a lot of work to get our first bicycle master plan finished in 1971 or 1972. And he pushed through numerous underpasses under the highways that were built during that time and so on. And managed to create the ideas for those direct connections between the city center and suburbs. And that's when the basis for our bicycle network was laid. So I wanted to show you this place here. As you've noticed, we are at a construction zone here. Right. So they are building a new bicycle superhighway here. Ah, OK. And look how wide it's going to be. Yeah. So that's 6.6 .6 meters. And to those not speaking metric, I think that should be like 22 feet. Right, right. 
Fantastic. And uh, for, for those who, uh, well, or I should say, let's let's get your uh, definition of what, uh, in Finland, what a bicycle superhighway actually is. Yeah, so uh, we have the direct connections uh, from A to B as direct as possible, where we have separated bicycles and people uh, walking to their own lanes. And uh, we have four meters for bi-directional bicycle traffic on red asphalt. And then we have two and a half meters for people walking, separated usually by a stone strip or, or a paint strip. And uh, always when just possible, we give that bicycle superhighway a priority in the crossings and we tend to minimize the crossings so that in most major crossings we have an underpass or an overpass where we also try to minimize the height difference and soon we will see some of them let's go and find some yeah let's go do it so here we have a kind of mock-up of a bicycle superhighway beginning here so this is just retrofitted coating Okay. And this wasn't wasn't actually built originally to be like this. But when we started building our bicycle superhighways, we actually of course we needed acceptance so that people understand what the bicycle superhighways are and what they will be before we start building them so that people will actually give us the budget to build them. Right. So we did a couple of examples like this in busy locations and where we could just to resurf resurface the path that was here already okay and point out the different lanes and people loved even this one even though this should be much wider and we should take like at least a lane away from the cars right but so this was a good example and uh, with the help of these and a couple of other locations we managed to get the acceptance and build our first, first bicycle superhighway along which we were in the very beginning of this recording. Right. So as you see here, it's way too narrow. Right. As of now, I'm really showing you basically the worst, worst that you can experience here on the bicycle with so many stops and so on. Right. But once we get past these traffic lights here, there are no more traffic lights uh, up, up ahead until like, let me think, like 35 kilometers for the first traffic lights after this one. Oh, wow. That's amazing. So after this crossing here with the single car here, so now there are no more level crossings with motor traffic for five kilometers, not a single one. Wow. Okay. And so really, yeah, that commitment to, to doing underpasses, high quality underpasses, hopefully, uh, so that you, you're not at the same level as the motor vehicle traffic. That's extraordinary. Exactly. And underpasses generally are much better than overpasses because you gain some speed and momentum on your way down, which, is, which then helps you to climb up from there. And you need to make them like, what is the opposite of steep? Uh, yeah, shallow. You 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 don't shallow, want it. Yeah. yeah, you yeah. don't you don't want too steep of a a, a a descent and or ascent. So yeah, yeah, indeed. So it's as easy as that, and all the motor traffic has to stop there for red lights and so on. Right. So for example, this path it existed here already in seventies, part of Maori's great plan, but it was just a regular three meter shared pedestrian and bicycle path right. and just recently we've upgraded it as you can probably see here so it's quite comfortable now and as we are getting further we will get further away from that national main road so yeah. we are not being disturbed by that horrible right. noise from them right yeah and of course three meters is about uh, 10 feet and what would you say the number of meters of this uh, uh, facility is now it's 6.6. 6.6. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. And that's about so 22 tw feet. That's, yeah, that's exactly. It's about 22 feet. Fantastic. Yeah, it, it really feels quite comfortable uh, when you're when you're out there and clearly you can have, uh, you know, the, the bicycle traffic there and also uh, pedestrians have their space. 
Uh, it, do you see much in the way of conflict between people riding bikes and uh, people who are walking when when you have a facility such as this? No, not basically not at all. Yeah. And also the conflict, the amount of conflict is also pretty minimal, even on traditional paths, because so many people are already walking and cycling that it's nothing surprising to anybody. So everybody knows to expect that there will be people walking and there will be people cycling. So even on those shared paths, people are, when they're walking, they are walking at the edge. Right. Uh, So they are not like blocking the whole path usually. Right. So now that we're we're on this this cycle path, this is a super highway, obviously through here. Talk a little bit about uh, the the maintenance. Uh, you mentioned the maintenance during the winter time. Uh, how does that happen, and and what sort of the approach to to maintaining these facilities? Yeah, that is a really really important point as well. So naturally, all the main bicycle paths and also the secondary bicycle paths are maintained during the winter time so it's everything because we don't have a third class <laughs> and uh, they, they are maintained throughout the winter so whenever there's snowfall they are being cleared and uh, the traditional way for first class bicycle routes was so that in, in case of snowfall if there's more than if, if there's three centimeters of more you need to clear that before 7 a.m and again before 3 p.m. So before traffic peak hours, you need to have treat, you need to have had them treated so that people can cycle all all day around right. wherever they need to go. But uh, that wasn't enough, so that would maybe give two or three plow rounds a day if if there's a lot of continuous snowfall and it, if it happened to be so that during the evening time there was a heavy snowfall the requirement was to only clear them by 7 a.m the next morning but if you're working late or actually you just have need to go somewhere during the evening it could create some problems for that also traditionally the contracting world here or the main winter maintenance world the whole city area is uh, divided into 14 different areas operated by public and private companies. And uh, whenever you're going from A to B, you usually go from an area to another or even through a couple of areas if you're cycling a longer journey. Right. And there could be a lot of quality variations between different areas because not every contractor is working at the same time or using exactly the same type of machinery or so on. And that would be problematic sometimes. So you couldn't really trust if the whole route has been maintained properly, even though you should be able to trust trust that naturally. Right. So uh, about 10 years ago, mm-hmm. we came up with the idea of a super super maintenance class where we would have regionally the most important bicycle routes from and to the city center and also the neighboring municipalities where we would only have those bicycle paths in the contract as opposed to uh, traditional contracts where you also have all the streets and so on in addition to bicycle paths. Right. But in this contract, we would only have the most important bicycle paths and uh, they would be treated as routes. So when they start from A, they will go through from the ho- through the whole route at one go. So we have like a route-based maintenance system. Right. In addition to that, we would uh, recruit voluntary maintenance agents who would ride them, these routes, on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. Whether, whether they are commuting or not doesn't really matter as, lo- as long as they are riding there. And they would rate the maintenance on a weekly basis. And the grades that they give to the maintenance would then directly affect affect to the uh, pay of the contractor. Got it. So if the agents are happy, the contractor gets more money. Yeah, yeah. It has been such a pleasure to, to get to know you. Thank you so very much. It's been such a joy having you on the Active Towns podcast. Thank you so much for doing this.